Got it. Okay, good. Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again to the Great Scott Podcast. Today, I am joined by voice actor extraordinaire, Mr. Bob Bergen. How's it going, Bob? What is going on? Happy Sunday. I have to ask you, what's all that in the background? All those voice, uh, all those all faces? the heads, all the heads yeah. up here. So I collect life masks of famous people. So above me, I don't know if you can tell, but I've got everybody from Bob Hope to Marlon Brando and James Cagney and Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff and Jack Nicholson at the very top. I've got Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr and Robin Williams is up there somewhere and uh, Cagney and and Hitchcock. So yeah, I, I, that's that's one of my hobbies is I collect life masks of uh, artists uh, that I admire. So how long uh, has it taken you to collect all, all those? I've been doing this off and on for to over 20 years and, um, you know, not so the reason why they even exist is because during the studio system where actors were signed to a contract with the studio, they would make a life mask of the performer. That was part of the contract. Uh, in the event, they might need to do extensive makeup on them, and they didn't want the actor to sit there as they experimented on what would look good, so they would experiment on the life mask. Mm. And uh, some people, uh, like um, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, was never um, a celebrity on camera, except for cameos in his films, yeah. but he happened to have a life mask made. I actually uh, started uh, looking into this because I was I want I Googled to see if Mel Blanc had a life mask and, and he didn't, and of course he did, there was no reason to. But then I found, uh, I think the first one I got was um, was James Cagney, I went, that's cool. So I just, I bid on auctions and either I win or I don't. <clears throat> Are there some that you hope hope to get that you haven't gotten yet? Um, yeah, um, I'm I'm still trying to get uh, Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro. They exist. Um, yeah, you know, and every once in a while something will pop up, like on a private auction, and I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that one existed. And then there's a whole bunch I don't care about. I'm like, yeah. and, and people know that I collect these, so they'll say like, "Ooh, would you like a Nicolas Cage life mask?" So I'm like, "No, thank you for asking." <laughs> I'm sure it's delightful. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's talk about you, Bob, and, and your uh, your incredible career that you've had. Uh, it really started for you at a uh, very young age. Uh, like I think at like age five, it was you always wanted to be the voice of uh, Porky Pig. But then yeah. your, your mom told you something that uh, you you can't be Porky Pig. Yeah, she said you can't be Porky Pig or Jewish, which I didn't even understand because um, we weren't what you'd call the most religious Jews on the block. Um, we, we had a menorah, you know, for Hanukkah that was next to our Christmas tree. So, um, and I, so I didn't understand why Porky Pig couldn't be Jewish. It didn't make any sense to me. Also, let's be really honest. I'm a five-year-old kid who says to his parents, I want to be a cartoon character. I might as well have said, I want to be Superman. So, uh, I don't think she took it, uh, she took it with a grain of salt. You know, this is a kid with an active imagination today. He wants to be an animated pig tomorrow. He might be, want to be an astronaut. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but you definitely proved her wrong. And because uh, you uh, have been doing the voice of Porky Pig ever since uh, 1990, if I'm not mistaken. This is very true. Yeah. Uh, this March will be 33 years that I've I've voiced them. And I'm not the only one who voices them. I mean, there, there's there are none of us who do classic characters have a lifetime contract to do these characters. I think I've done them probably 95 percent of the time. But um, yeah, you know, um, I don't own the character. So uh, when Warner Brothers has a new project, sometimes they just say, hey, would you like to work Thursday? And sometimes they say, hey, would you like to audition Thursday? So that's just the nature of being a freelance voice actor. Now, I heard something uh, interesting as far as Porky Pig goes. When, when Mel had died, uh, I guess his son, Noel, couldn't do all the voices. So they hired, uh, hired you, you to be uh, the voice of Porky Pig? Yes and no. Um, Mel Blank went on about a one to two year PR tour on TV and radio and basically promoted his son as the heir apparent who would be taking over for him. And the, the first uh, major project after Mel passed away was Tiny Tunes. And they had Noel in to record Tiny Tunes. And, you know, I think Noel would be the first to say he doesn't come close to his dad. And by the way, neither do I, and neither does anybody who do these characters today. Um, yeah. But they had Noel in and they took his dad's word for it. And, you know, after two years of PR, they just went, man, this is probably true. Um, you know, I think the studio realized he wasn't as close to his dad. I think he knew he wasn't as close to his dad. And um, 
they had me come in and audition over. I, I had like a dozen auditions before this ever happened. And um, and then they had me come in and actually replace him. And uh, in the first uh, uh, episode he did uh, um, and so forth and so on. Um, I've never met him. Actually, I take that back. I met him once when his dad was still alive. Uh, I went to a, a book signing. His dad had written an autobiography and I went to a book signing. I met Noel. And, I, and at that point, I thought I didn't stand a chance because I had heard, like everybody else, that he was going to be doing all of these characters. So, um, yeah, that's basically kind of sort of how that evolved. But, um, you know, the nicest part about that story is that his dad went to his grave thinking his son was going to take over, which is delightful. It's lovely. Mm. Wow, that's great. So um, were you surprised when you got the phone call to uh, be the voice of Porky Pig since that was your dream ever since you were like a young boy? Actually, I didn't get the call. My mom did, which is kind of uh, the coolest part of the story because here's this kid who said he wants to be Porky Pig. I had just bought my first home and um, I was at a voiceover session. Uh, my mom was house sitting for me because I had furniture being delivered and she got the call from my agent that I booked that first Tiny Toon session, which was so cool because for her to get the call was kind of uh poetic it was kind of nice um was i surprised um i was i was happy yes um i i wasn't i wouldn't say i was surprised because i i worked so hard on it and i knew that character better than i knew myself i would have been uh disappointed had i not yeah. um but i will tell you that you know, anybody who has a major goal in life, I met that goal at 26. So, you know, it was a combination of, you know, elated and now what do I do? You know, because, you, you know, meeting your lifelong goal at such a young age, what else do you do? Well, you know, this franchise is a tiny portion of my annual career. So, you know, I met the goal and I do all kinds of other things too. So, um, yeah, but it was not, I, I, I'm honest, I don't, I don't mean to sound like I'm, I'm bragging, but I wasn't surprised. Sure. No, no. So no, no bragging there. Um, so uh, you've also, I mean, to go along with your, your amazing career that you've had, you also uh, hosted a, uh, a, a game show called uh, Jep, which is based I did. on, uh, I think that uh, we all know as uh, Jeopardy. Um, yeah. If you did the, the kids version of it, did you get to know uh, Trebek well at all? No, uh, I met him twice in my life. Um, he came to one taping um, and I met him there. And then I met him at the Daytime Emmy Awards a few years ago, about probably about a year before he passed away. Um, uh, yeah, Jep was kind of a, um, an uh, unplanned anomaly in my career. Um, I had been promoting the first Space Jam movie. I was on a, some New York talk show. And I got a call from a hosting agent who said, hey, I saw you on this show and you were really good. Have you ever thought of hosting? And I said, no, not really. Uh, but thank you for asking. And I, I was just sharing that with my voiceover agent who said, look, don't be an idiot. If, if they know your face, I can get you more for your voice. So I told the agent, yeah, all right, um, I'll give it a shot. And I wasn't that enthusiastic about it because I didn't know how to do it. And I wasn't interested in doing it. The first audition they sent me on, I think it was called uh, either Kids Jeopardy or Junior Jeopardy. It was the same producers as the, the syndicated Jeopardy. And I just didn't care. So I went, I think that's a, a really good uh, lesson for actors. Um, have fun. But if you don't care, you're not, there's nothing to lose. So just yeah. go in there and do it. And I had an audition, then I had a callback, then I had a screen test. And for my screen test, we ran an episode of Jeopardy on the set of Jeopardy. And the three contestants were children, but they were the children of Sony executives, mm. uh, the people that ran the studio. <laughs> so um, I walked up to the kids before my screen test and I said, guys, make me look good. I'll buy you each a car. <laughs> and um, and then I got lucky because one of the clues was famous cartoon characters. And for every clue, I did the voice. And one of the producers or writers, I forget who, came up to me and said, have you ever thought of voiceover? And I said, it's, that's my day job. Because they didn't know what I did. Nobody, you know, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing in show business. So um, so that's how that came about. Wow, that's incredible. So um, 
going backwards for just a moment, because uh, uh, I think that I, I failed to mention, um, you had a uh, rather uh, interesting encounter with Mel, Mel Blanc. Uh, are you talking about the phone call? The phone call, yeah. Yeah, um, we, we moved to LA when I was 14 and I just thought I'm gonna call him up and ask for advice. And um, I looked in the phone book and it wasn't there. And my dad, we had, we had just moved from Ohio. My dad said, you know, LA is a much larger uh, area than Cincinnati. Cincinnati had one phone book. LA has, you know, dozens. So my dad traveled all over uh, LA County. And he went from like, you know, uh, Studio City. Then he went to Malibu. Then he went to Pasadena. And we had no idea where this guy lived. And he just collected white page phone books. And I just called every blank in the book until I found him under his wife's name in the Pacific Palisades. Wow. But then you had uh, actually met him in in the studio and you had pretended to be uh, his assistant. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, he mentioned the name of the studio he was working at that week when I was talking to him on the phone. So when I hung up and he didn't say the day or the time, just the name of the studio. And I called up the studio pretending to be his assistant. And I said, hi, I'm, I'm just calling to confirm Mr. Blank's appointment. And I just made up a date <laughs> and time. I said, uh, so we'll see you Thursday at nine. And the receptionist says, well, we have them on the books for Wednesday at 11. I went, oh, you're right. I'm looking at the wrong date on the calendar. So I told my mom, we're going to, I'm going to skip school on Wednesday and you're going to take me to watch Mel Blank work. And she said, cool. So um, I got to the studio and I said to the receptionist, hi, we're guests of Mel Blank. And he said, we can watch. And she pointed me in the direction where he was recording. And I walked into his booth and I said to his producer, hi, we're really good friends with the receptionist. And she said, we could watch. And that's how I got to watch him work. Wow. Wow. So was it Warner Brothers that you went to, to watch him? No, no. It was a studio called uh, Bell Sound in Hollywood. Oh, okay. Yeah. Warner Brothers closed down their animation department in the, in the sixties. Okay. So even though this was a Looney Tunes project, I think it was like a, like an arena show where they were uh, licensing the Looney Tunes characters. Think Disney on ice without Disney or ice. Um, and he was just pre-recording the soundtrack. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I rarely I rarely work at the, at the main lot, even today. I think I can count on less than one hand how many times I've actually recorded anything for Looney Tunes. I, both Space Jam movies. Well, actually, I take that back. The first Space Jam movie we, we recorded at Warner's. I did a few episodes of of new Looney Tunes at Warner proper. But for the most part, we record at different studios all over town. Today, we record from our home studio due to COVID. So I have, I, 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 in fact, I probably will count on one hand how many times in my, the rest of my life I'll ever work outside my home because I much prefer working from home. Yeah. I was going to ask you, is that your studio that you record from? Is that your is, well, this is my, this is my office. Yeah. Yeah. So and I've got a recording booth here. I can show, I show it to you if I can show it to you without showing you my messy desk but that's my box my booth and i just record from that box i'm in that box for auditions or jobs every day wow so um to go along with uh, like i said everything else that you've gotten to do you've gotten to actually um uh meet some of the biggest stars and and uh, interview them kind of like uh, how i've uh been lucky enough to do myself and i just wanted to ask you about a couple of them that i'm very fascinated about and uh, one of them is a uh, jimmy stewart and the other one is well, uh, I wouldn't say I actually interviewed Jimmy Stewart or probably some of the people that you're talking about. I was a grandstand announcer for about 10 years at the Hollywood Christmas Parade. So there's there are moving cars coming down Sunset Boulevard, and I am there for the for the people in the grandstands. Uh, there's a there's a television uh, broadcast and there's a, there's a grandstand broadcast. And as this car is moving, I'm interviewing Jimmy Stewart. And I interviewed, you know, Sammy Davis and uh, Roseanne. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I, I, interviews are very uh, a little uh, deceiving of a word. It's 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 as a car passes by, you ask him a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Were they all pretty gracious about it? All, all of them were. Pretty well, yeah, because they were there on TV uh yeah. for a parade so of course they're going to be gracious yeah yeah absolutely so uh, and also another one i saw was uh steve allen that you got to talk yeah to. same 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 sort of thing yeah. um steve allen Zsa Zsa gabor i mean like, there's oodles of them uh uh neil patrick harris when he had just started doogie hauser oh, yeah. and um i think uh literally his voice had just changed he was a little boy and uh, he was charming as hell well, he still is, isn't he? <laughs> I'm I'm, I haven't I haven't seen him since. So, from what I see, he looks it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, there was also um, 
someone that really did help you get to where you're at and uh, someone that we all know is uh, uh, Casey Kasem. Uh, Casey Kasem's, uh, well, I guess his uh, agent uh, really did get you to where, where you're at uh, today. Well, Casey's agent, so what happened was uh, Casey sent me an autographed picture for my high school graduation. And he, we had a friend of the family that knew him. And I wrote him a thank you note and included my phone number. He called me up, uh, asked me if I had a demo. Uh, I didn't. Um, he said, make me something homemade and I'll see it. if I like it, I'll play it for my agent. Um, he liked it. His agent at the time was in the hospital uh, in an oxygen tent. And Casey went to the hospital with a little portable tape recorder and played it through the plastic. And a few weeks later, the agent recuperated and called me up and said, I'd love to represent you. And I said, I don't know what that means, but it's got to be after three o'clock because I have school. I had, so I hadn't graduated for, I had a few months before I graduated from high school. So uh, yeah, that's how I got my first agent, but I didn't know I'd hit the jackpot on my first agent because he also represented uh, June Foray and Orson Welles and Paul Winchell and Casey Kasem and just the creme de la creme of, uh, of uh, voiceover. And Don Pitts was his name. That was his name. He passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, I, I thought I heard something about him passing away. Like, yeah, yeah. He was, he was a sweet guy. He used to have me come into his office to practice auditioning, you know, um, back at, at that time you would audition in your agent's office. And um, I didn't know what the heck I was doing, you know? Um, but yeah, he was, he, he, he held my hand. I was with him for the first five years of my career. And I think it was uh, 85 tapes you had sent to Casey for all, all the voices that you had done. Say again. So I think I I, th I think I read somewhere that it was like eighty five uh, voiceover tapes that you had sent. Yeah, I know. I said I I did eighty five different voices on, oh, on different the tapes. Voices. No, I didn't send him eighty five tapes. No, that would be that that would be that would be a little uh, overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, Bob, you also uh, for those that uh, may not know and those that want to get into the voiceover industry, you actually do voiceover classes uh, yourself, teaching people how how to get into the industry. Yeah, I used to do classes. COVID took the classes away and I started doing Zoom private coaching, which I thoroughly enjoy. And I don't think I'll ever uh, revive the workshops here in Los Angeles just because it, it, taking the time, the drive time, it's just this is this is much more convenient. Um, I also on my Instagram, I, I've got dozens of I try, try to do one a day of little video tutorials on voiceover the industry, the business of the business. Um, but no, I, I, I love teaching. Teaching's fun. And I'll be sure to include the Instagram down below whenever I do post cool. the interview. And, cool. Uh, yeah. People, I take, I, I, at first I was just doing whatever was off the top of my head. And then I, yeah, about a week or so ago, maybe two, I said, guys, you got questions, ask me. And I give them my email address for them to ask me. And holy cow, did they keep coming in? I don't answer everyone because I answered a lot of them already, yeah. but I'm going to be doing one today. Actually, when we're done with this, uh, the question was, um, so how do you know when you're ready to pursue voiceover full time? Which I thought was a great question. So I'll be answering that when we're done. Okay. Okay. And uh, you can look for Bob's post on uh, February 5th because this today's the 5th of February and he'll he'll be uh, answering that that question. But there you uh, go. So, uh, I, so I know that uh, you um, answer it uh, all, uh, but is there one main piece of advice that you would give to someone who wants to get into the voiceover industry? Yeah, it's called voice acting for a reason. It is acting. Yeah. So don't take a voiceover class before you take acting classes. Study acting, study improv. And don't just take one or two classes and say, no, I'm going to go do voiceover. I was at a two-year conservatory for acting and three years of improv. And then I started. Uh, and well, I was studying voiceover throughout that too, but I was a lousy actor. Uh, I didn't know how to act. So if you if you go to voiceover classes without knowing what to do with those words or how to take direction, you're spending a lot of money and you're spinning your wheels. So become a great actor and then study voiceover. Um, but you want to do it thoroughly. Um, and I know everybody's impatient and we live in the uh, instant gratification generation, but one bad demo ruins an entire career. Um, so be be ready, be prepared but want it more than anything and be willing to work harder than everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because I saw on your website that you had worked with uh, pretty much every LA voice coach there was, or voiceover coach, I guess there was for the, for yeah, I, I studied, I studied at that time. It was for, it was four years of voiceover classes. Yeah. If they took, if they offered a class, I took it. Some were great. Some were not so much, but you know, instead of dwelling on, while well, that wasn't as good as the other ones, I would bank the, 
10% that I left with and disregard the 90%. I'm not one who dwells on the negatives. So um, yeah, uh, if they offered a class, I took it. And some classes I stayed with for months. One, my first voiceover class I stayed with for almost two years. So, and then I would do like Dawes Butler. I, I stayed off and on for 10. Um, it just depends on, on, um, and I still, by the way, I will, I will still work with a coach. If something, if I, if, if, if I'm auditioning to be a, a network promo voice and I get to, uh, down to the wire and there's a test, they want to test me, uh, I'm going to work with a promo coach and just to make sure that they're hearing, uh, what I'm hearing in my head. It's hard to be very subjective when, when you're doing it yourself. Uh, so yeah. Um, every once in a while, you know, before COVID, if I was like, eh, I need to, eh, I'm kind of going through the motions acting wise. I need someone to kick my butt a little bit. I'll go back to my, uh, uh, acting coach and say, okay, hurt me. You know, I need, I need, I need a little bit of kick. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so Bob, uh, I thank you so much for your time, uh, being on here. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, is there anything that I can promote for you? That I can talk about? Are you sure? Yeah, because there's a lot we can't. Um, huh. Oh, that's a good question. I never remember how to answer this question. Uh, Looney Tunes cartoons, HBO Max, Bugs Bunny Builders uh, on HBO Max and and Cartoon Network. Um, let's see. Uh, Oddballs on, I believe, Netflix. Ridley Jones on Netflix. The Bad Batch on Cartoon Network. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, lots of stuff on Nickelodeon, uh, Blaze and the Machines, It's Pony. Uh, yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, it definitely sounds like it. Yeah, <laughs> and like I said, I'll, I'll be sure to post that uh, Instagram of, uh, of yours down down below when I uh, go to post this interview. But uh, but Bob, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for doing. You this. bet. You bet. My pleasure. Much continued success to you, sir. Thank you, my friend. You too.